Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, everybody at IPAM who made it all possible and trying to figure out how to deal with things and deal in the best possible way. Really, many, many thanks for your communication, for your, for your involvement. The, the world feels uh, a bit closer with people like you. Thank you. So, uh, I will talk about the joint work with Andrea Davini from Sapienza University of Rome. And since he is not present, he has a lot of teaching and all. Uh, I've, he, I put his picture in here. Uh, um, I will start probably right away with the kind of equation I, I would like to homogenize. And in a way, I, I structured my talk in a way that it's uh, not exactly a continuation of the previous talk by Attila Yilmaz, but if you were present in that talk, it will connect to Attila's talk, except that it's going to be, in some sense, um, anti uh, undoing all the stochastic analysis presented by Attila. So I will be looking at the uh, viscous hamilton jacobi equation and uh, small parameter epsilon in one space dimension. I'm looking at the Cauchy problem. And uh, this is my Hamiltonian H. It's uh, separated, meaning that the momentum part is separated from the potential. And for people who are in PDEs and a real hamilton Jacobi people, I want to say, just for your intuition, that yes, we are writing Hamiltonian in the wrong side of the equation. So uh, uh, this, this means that your intuition about kind of mon mon monotonicity is uh, flipped over. For example, if I take a larger function g, then uh, sort of things tend, will, will tend to go up, right? If I take smaller function g, uh, then they will tend to go down. So it's opposite to, I, I assume, your intuition about uh, Hamiltonian-Jacobi equation with Hamiltonian on the other side. We can easily switch from one to the other by taking uh, u to minus u and g of p to g of minus p. So uh, as before, we have a random medium, which is expressed as a, we have a probability space, omega fp. We require omega to be Polish space. This is inherited from the paper of Cardelli Gay and Suganidis, which we are using. Um, measure P is invariant under the shifts by X and ergodic with respect to the shifts. This is a standard uh, uh, setting of stationary ergodic homogenization. And then we have two coefficients, A and V, for two functions to stationary processes. We make an assumption that A and V are Lipschitz and take values in 0, 1. So it's, it's not much of a restriction, except that we, are, we, we, we say that they are bounded. A, a could be degenerate. That's not a problem. And uh, the magnitude of potential, just like in Attila stock, is regulated by parameter beta. So for the purposes of the talk, A and V will be like fixed uh, stationary processes. I am not going to change them. In addition, I will assume that essential infimum of V is zero and essential supremum V is one, almost surely. So it's, again, it's the same setting uh, as before. And I will have, I will put valley and hill condition, which I till explained, but I will explain it again. I'll put it later. So this parameter, this stationary processes are kind of chosen, fixed, they are there. And then, uh, I will have a constant beta, non-negative constant, and a function g, which is continuous superlinear super linear function. And uh, examples of uh, functions g I'm going to be talking about uh, include the one which the quadratic one with a double well, uh, 
which is different from a tilde, is just by a constant. I added back the c squared over two. And as well as uh, Hamiltonians, uh, I mean, non-linearities, non which look like this. So in my, in my setting, I will have a, sort of the idea is how do we get rid of quadratic dependence on, on P? How do we, can we generalize the homogenization result um, to rather wide, uh, uh, under wide assumptions on function G? Well, the answer is unfortunately no and yes. Well, no is unfortunate and yes is, is fortunate. So what the, the, the talk will follow pretty much the same technique, the same I, general ideas as for quadratic case, but the game here is to remove stochastic analysis and to replace everything with uh, uh, analytic estimates. So uh, I will say that equation one, this is equation one, homogenizes if there is a continuous coercive function h bar such that with probability one for every initial uniformly continuous initial data, g of x, the solutions to equation one converge locally uniformly in time and space to the deterministic function which solves the effective equation with that same initial data. So typically I would ask, does anybody have any questions about what kind of equation I'm going to consider? Any questions about the setting? Um, I'm asking this, so if, if, if I missed something or forgot something, please let me know. Well, since nobody is asking questions, I'll move on. By the way, the slides are actually available on the website. And if you want to go back, you could open the slides and look, look, look at them uh, uh, if you prefer. So two remarks at you. I know that in this audience, it's almost, uh, uh, I, may, I should not maybe make these remarks, but I will still, uh, if there are any graduate students or postdocs or people are not involved with, uh, with the topic. So it is known that under conditions, which we check in our paper with Andrea, it is sufficient to prove homogenization in the general sense, as I defined before, it's sufficient to show that for every theta, we have convergence just at the point x one in time and x equals zero to h bar of theta where u epsilon set is a solution of the equation with a linear initial data. And basically what I'm saying is that the game here is to identify the effective Hamiltonian. The rest depends actually on uh, estimates, on Lipschitz estimates, on, I mean, on, on generalities which one can hope to resolve. So that's what we are going to do. We will try to construct the effective, the candidate for effective Hamiltonian, prove this convergence. And the rest is already done uh, once you check the conditions. Uh, for example, for this particular paper, we use our previous work with Andrea, we, where we actually show that this is enough. Uh, and of course, I recall that a linear function this linear function solves this equation with linear initial data. So for t equals one and x equals zero, this function is just equal to h bar of theta. That's why h bar of theta appears here. And the second standard remark is that when you have linear initial data, your solution is just a scaling of the original uh, u of the original function. So we are interested basically in the scaling limit of and the hyperbolic scaling of time and space of our solution. Right. And the effective Hamiltonian therefore, if the limit exists, is written in this way, or switching from one over epsilon to t is written this way. So the notation uh, I'm going to use is the following. If uh, h bar exists, right, then given beta 
and given G, the effective Hamiltonian will be denoted by this curly H with index beta of G. It's like a map. You give me beta and G, and I will give you the effective Hamiltonian. So now to state the theorem, I need conditions on V and G, and I will give now precise conditions. One of them on V, the only additional condition is again, valley and hill condition. Attila explained it uh, very nicely. So I'll put it again, that uh, V satisfies say a valley condition. This is a picture of valley condition. If given any level H between zero and one, any level H between zero and one, and any positive number Y, the probability that um, the potential stays below H for all X between negative one and uh, negative Y and Y is positive. See, we don't care. This probability may be very tiny. It may uh, go to zero extremely fast as you increase y, it doesn't really matter. All we need is just that positivity. So that is a valley condition. The hill condition is uh, symmetric, defined in a similar way. Uh, so what this condition does uh, is the following. Uh, this condition allows us to pin down the flat pieces in our effective Hamiltonian. Without it, yesterday I asked if and you whether maybe somebody knows how to, how to find the bottom of the effective Hamiltonian in say even periodic viscous case. Or uh, so far, we don't know unless we have this condition. This condition allows us exactly to find where the bottom is, where the flat here, where the flat pieces are going to be, at which level and get matching upper and lower bounds. Function G uh, satisfies a standard set of assumptions. These assumptions uh, uh, we, we inherited from the paper by Armstrong and Tran, uh, where they proved uniform Lipschitz bounds and for rather general convex and non-convex Hamiltonians and comparison principles for convex uh, superlinear Hamiltonians. I know that the literature on these topics is vast, but for us, it was very convenient reference. Um, uh, so the conditions are that G has a power growth, superlinear power growth in P and satisfies this second condition. Uh, well, it's also growth can uh, sort of a growth condition. So with these assumptions, we can state the theory. Under the above conditions on A, V, and G, the equation one homogenizes, and the effective Hamiltonian is characterized in the following way. We have two regimes. One of them we call strong potential. So here Attila called it weak control. Here we don't have any control. So in this situation, um, beta represents the magnitude of the potential. So we say strong potential, meaning that potential uh, plays a dominating role in this setting. And if beta is greater or equal than G of P hat, I did not tell you what P hat is. So the function G, the function G is assumed to be of this form. So it consists of two convex pieces separated. So at the, jun the junction point is P hat, right? So uh, below P hat, we call it G minus. Above P hat, we call it G plus. And both pieces have minimum at C minus and C plus respectively. And the minimum value of both parts is zero. So this is unfortunate. We would be very much, very happy to deal with unequal minima, but that's the setting where we can so far manage. Otherwise, we can take not quadratic, just any function g plus or g minus, which satisfies these conditions. And uh, 
proof homogenization result. So given G, if beta is greater or equal than G of P hat, this is exactly the depth of the well. I mean, so each well has the same depth by, by assumption. So if beta exceeds that depth, then we have uh, convexification and the effective Hamiltonian, which is always orange in my, in, in my pictures, the effective Hamiltonian is convex and is given in terms of effective Hamiltonians for its, part, its parts for G plus here and G minus. For G plus effective Hamiltonian is this, for G minus say effective Hamiltonian is that, and then they are connected connected by the common flat piece at, at, at height beta. So in short, we can say that the effective Hamiltonian is a convex hull of the minimum of the effective Hamiltonian of its pieces. And we also prove it's not a completely, it's not actually obvious statement that convexification in this, in this regime, convexification commutes with homogenization, meaning if we first take a convex hull of G plus and G minus, and then we get a convex uh, Hamiltonian, we get convex function G, then we do homogenization, we'll get the same effective Hamiltonian as, uh, as here. So in this, uh, under our condition, in our conditions, convexification commutes with homogenization. This will be used uh, for our second theory, which says that we can actually deal not only with two, joining two convex functions, we can join a third one and a fourth one, any finite number, as long as they have the same minimum. So in the case of the strong potential, we have convexification, we have perfective Hamiltonian, which is convex and given by this formula. In the case of a weak potential, so opposite inequality holds, so therefore the depths of the wells are larger than beta, so potential is weak, we get, uh, get non-convex effective Hamiltonian, which is constructed in the, in the following way. We'll take effective Hamiltonians for its pieces, G plus and G minus, and then just at height, G of P hat, we take a horizontal line, which cuts the effective Hamiltonians of the pieces, and we obtain this orange curve, which I'm tracing right now. So this is the effective Hamiltonian in the case of the weak potential. So this, these points are just intersection points of the horizontal line at the height G of P hat and the effective Hamiltonian for G minus. And here also intersection of horizontal line at the height G of P hat and the effective Hamiltonian for G plus. So this is our first theorem, which uh, generalizes uh, Attila's, uh, uh, what Attila talked about, our, the previous result. So to prove something like that, we don't have, we cannot inherit the tools, the, the stochastic tools, which Attila presented. First, we don't have hope call because we don't have quadratic Hamiltonians. Therefore, we cannot linearize the parts or our convex parts of our Hamiltonian. Therefore, we cannot have a feynman katz formula. So we have a lot of things to, to do here. But fortunately, analysis, uh, we are able to translate the arguments or the sequence of arguments into analytic, uh, in, in, in analytic, uh, basically using comparison principle with uh, somewhat uh, cleverly designed functions at times. We can actually follow the steps and give a proof of this theorem. I will say a few words a little bit later. Our second theorem, as I said before, it just says that we can join together any, any number of convex pieces, any finite number of convex pieces. And uh, the key result to do that 
is this result about uh, about the the fact that con convexification um, is <laughs> for some reason I'm I'm a little um, nervous probably because I'm not used to not seeing people around me not seeing the faces so conv convexification commutes with homogenization um, so how how we can show this result if we know the previous result so we basically we look at each junction point and we can say that if we take convex hull of everything which is to the left and convex hull of Hamiltonians of everything which is to the right, we have only two pieces. And this, uh, and this, is, this situation is dealt with in the previous theorem. We have effective Hamiltonian. If we take the next junction and take convex hull of this piece and convex hull of everything to the right here, there is nothing. Uh, uh, then we have again just two 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 pieces. Therefore, we can do we can find effective Hamiltonian, and each of them, each of so constructed effective Hamiltonians, is going to be lower, not higher, lower than 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 the one which we are aiming for, right? We'll, it's going to be lower than than the each for each piece. Therefore, the maximum of all of these effective Hamiltonians is going to be less or equal than, than the, will provide us with a lower bound. On the other hand, uh, if we take for each pair, we take the effective Hamiltonian for each pair, since each pair is higher than the minimum of more functions, the effective Hamiltonian for each pair is greater or equal than the effective Hamiltonian we are trying to construct. So the minimum of those gives us an upper bound, and uh, these two actually coincide. So it's actually it's a very short and simple argument to get from two pieces to any finite number of pieces. And as I already said, the key story is that we can interchange homogenization and convexification in, under our assumptions. Now I want to say a few words about the proof. So we are given beta and G, and we want, we make, uh, we denote Liminf by H beta of G with a superscript L and Lim sup with H beta of G with a sub superscript U. So the upper and lower. We want to get the upper bound on H U and lower bound on H L so that the upper and lower bounds are exactly the same. So the first observation is completely simple. Since G plus is above G and G minus is above G, then the upper bound we are looking at is less or equal than the minimum of H bet of G plus and H bet of G minus. So it, this gives us an easy uniform upper bound. Uh, then the next piece is, we'll show that the lower bound is greater or equal than beta. This is exactly where we use the Hill condition. This is a use of comparison principle where we glue together some comparison functions, which allow us to conclude uh, that the lower bound is greater or equal than beta. The next piece is that the effective Hamiltonian at G plus and G minus is less or equal than beta at C plus and C minus. This is a simple comparison with a linear function. This is, again, this is a very easy step which does not use anything. So the, this step uses Hill condition. So what do we have so far? So far we have upper bound. This is the minimum of effective Hamiltonians over pieces. Then we have a uniform lower bound, which is beta. So lower bound here is orange. 
and the upper bound is blue. And then the probably the trickiest upper bound is the one for theta between C minus and C plus, which says that the HU, the limb soup, is does not exceed the maximum of beta and and the depths and the and so in the depths of the well here. Right. So this again uses a condition on our potential. It this uses the valley condition on the potential. That the potential can stay very close to zero for long time with positive probability. So this is translated from stochastic argument to PD argument again using a uh, specially constructed uh, comparison uh, function solution. So therefore, after all these steps, what we gained, we have blue upper bound and orange lower bound. So we still have the shaded areas here is where we don't know where where our effective Hamiltonian is not pinned down. So we have still a lot of freedom for effective Hamiltonian. This picture shows uh, the strong potential case. In the weak potential case, of course, this upper bound is gonna be better. So we will have matching on the whole long interval between C minus and C plus, including plus flat pieces. So what, what, what shall we do with, with leftover pieces? Well, the answer is uh, we'll construct correctors for them. Now, um, now, Attila could construct correctors using feynman katz formula. We have another tool. We are very happy that there was a paper by Pierre Cardelligue and Takis Suganidis, which says the following that if you, I mean, under conditions, if there is homogenization in probability, then correctors exist for all extreme points of sub-level sets of the effective Hamiltonian. Well, since our pieces are convex, and for convex Hamiltonians, we know homogenization, we know that for G plus and G minus, correctors exist outside of flat pieces. And therefore, uh, well, we can check the conditions under which uh, to make sure that correctors indeed are there. And they're not just correctors. When we say correctors, we mean sublinear correctors. So more precisely, we argue that for every theta such that the effective Hamiltonian of a piece G plus or G minus is strictly larger than beta, strictly larger than the height of the flat piece. On a set of full measures, there is a unique sublinear solution to the stationary equation, satisfying uh, conditions that at zero, it's a zero. And moreover, we say that this, oh, we derive properties of, uh, things which appear here. So, so the set of full measures shifted variant. The solution is Lipschitz uh, with a constant which depends on theta where, uh, where this constant is locally bounded. And V prime of set as a gradient is stationary even though we do not use stationarity of the gradient. So we have a corrector for G plus minus or outside of flat pieces. So now what's left is if we can show that this derivative, this derivative plus theta lies exactly in the regions where we don't have our homogenization. So if we can find appropriate bounds on, uh, on this term, then G plus and G minus are equal to our G. So these specific correctors will work for our non-convex non Hamiltonian. So uh, we establish bounds on V plus theta uh, on, on derivative of uh, a corrector. And these bounds are exactly those that we need. 
And we use these characters, which were constructed for G plus and G minus. We use these characters for our non-convex G in appropriate intervals. And these appropriate intervals, as I said, happen to be exactly where we want them to be. So now we have upper bounds, lower bounds, and on these intervals, we have correctors, sublinear correctors. And the, the, the importance of having sublinear correctors is that we can identify the effective Hamiltonian to be exactly the same. So our effective Hamiltonian now is defined everywhere except for the middle piece. In the middle piece, we still don't have anything except for the upper bound is at the level of G of P hat. The lower bound is at the level beta and uh, we don't have matching upper and lower bounds. But so far, uh, in all other, for all other seta, we, we, have, we have constructed the effective Hamiltonian for our non-convex non problem. So the, the final cut, right? So this, uh, how do we deal with this piece? This argument actually was invented by Yilmaz, not, I mean, was, uh, comes from the paper of Attila Yilmaz and Ophazit Zituni, discrete paper. And it's essentially monotonicity and continuity argument. So I would like to, I have an upper bound here. And I would like to show that the lower bound matches this upper bound. How do I do that? For beta equals zero, so I'm, this is my original, this is my original Hamiltonian. As I increase beta, so G is fixed here, and as I increase beta and consider equation for different values of beta, the effective Hamiltonians increase. So this orange one is the one which I am after. The green one is the effective Hamiltonian for intermediate beta, intermediate beta. And for all intermediate beta, I have the same reasoning as before, and I constructed effective Hamiltonian up to this point. But now this point for the lower Hamiltonian lies exactly in the region where I want to find my uh, lower bound. So by comparison, my effective Hamiltonian should be larger than the, or equal to the effective Hamiltonian for the smaller beta. But effective Hamiltonian for the smaller beta is here. So therefore, I recover, I recover this region. Of course, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm hiding the fact that, yes, we have to prove monotonicity, we have to prove, uh, we have to, th there is a continuity in beta, monot strict monotonicity in beta, so everything uh, needs to be shown, but the crucial part of the argument is, is, is very simple. Since we know that our effective Hamiltonian is at least as large as the green one, and the green one at this point is at this level, and this is the upper bound for our effective Hamiltonian, we are done. So this recovers the effective Hamiltonian in full and uh, completes, completes the proof. Right. Then I would like to spend, okay. Are there any questions for me? Then I would like to spend some time um, uh, to, to dis discuss literature. Of course, one dimensional case is very special case. And uh, uh, in general, we are interested, say, in this class of problems in RD. So A is a non-negative definite matrix. H is a Hamiltonian. Um, in general, I'm interested in non-convex Hamiltonians, which belong, which is, say, superlinear and satisfy conditions, natural conditions. Um,
when H is not convex in P, there are counterexamples to homogenization, and there are examples where homogenization takes place for dimensions uh, uh, greater or equal than two. So counterexamples to homogenization uh, go back. So the first one was actually constructed, I think, in December, to, at least I saw it in December 2015. Well, it's published later, constructed by Ziliotta. It's for inviscid case where A is identically zero, dimension two. He constructed the environment, which consists of uh, sort of vertical and horizontal intervals which could be extremely large, extremely, so he called them green and red intervals, um, uh, which, and using, on this environment, he defined a potential, a nice bounded potential, I think between one and two. Uh, the G part of Hamiltonian was essentially had linear growth in such a way that homogenization, lim sup was not equal to lim inf for, for the solution to the equation with this Hamiltonian and zero initial data. So the key, uh, the key feature of Hamiltonian which does not homogenize was, was a uh, stri strict saddle point uh, in his example at zero. Then Feldman and Suganidis generalized this example, basically saying that whenever G of P has a strict local saddle point, then it is possible to construct a random environment, which is very, very, very slowly mixing, uh, and a potential V so that homogenization fails. So this, this identified sort of one, at least one of the reasons for which homogenization may fail. And uh, this dealt with a non inviscid case. In viscous case, so uh, a couple of years later, last, I think I saw paper last May on archive, uh, when A is a constant and dimension is two, this example was uh, extended to, to the viscous case. So even in viscous case, it may occur that homogenization fails and the environment is sort of um, the same sort of environment which was constructed in the previous in the previous example. So if, if we are dealing with non-convex uh, Hamiltonian, yeah, homogenization in general, there is no blanket result to expect. Homogenization may fail. But, uh, but that means that the problem is a uh, much more difficult and much more uh, delicate. Uh, so I'm going to uh, basically uh, discuss uh, the literature that I'm aware of on stochastic, on positive results on stochastic homogenization. And I decided to go maybe, unfortunately, decided to start with a dimension one and then go to higher dimension. But in any case, the result which at least of one result I know of in dimension one came in 2009 is Davini and Sikanolfi uh, had a res homogenization result for level set convex Hamiltonians uh, only in dimension one. In higher dimension uh, for level set convex Hamiltonians homogenization in inviscid case was obtained by Armstrong and Suganidis and in inviscid case, the fact that we have this result for level set convex Hamiltonians and uh, other features of inviscid equation allowed Armstrong, Tran, and Yu to show under other general conditions homogenization for Hamiltonian, which is separated, again, in inviscid case. And then later, Gao extended it to uh, some classes of more general Hamiltonians with non when the momentum part is not separated uh, from the potential part, from the X part. So uh, for viscous case, uh, actually the very first example of homogenization for viscous case 
was given in all dimensions by Armstrong and Cardaligue in the case when uh, there is a finite range of dependence in the environment. And the Hamiltonian is a gamma homogeneous in the p variable, where gamma is strictly larger than one. So the condition is homogeneity, homogeneity condition. Um, right. And then for dimension one, Andrea Davini and I gave an example of uh, pinned Hamiltonians. So Hamiltonian is, for so an example of pinned Hamiltonian is, for example, this one. It is pinned at zero. So when p equals zero, no matter which x or omega you take, the Hamiltonian stays the same. Like in this case, it's a zero. This allows one to separate sort of what happens to the left of zero from what happens to the right of, ze of zero and get homogenization uh, for pinned Hamiltonian. And as long as uh, Hamiltonian in between the pinned points is convex. Then we already mentioned uh, papers by Yilmaz and Zituni in discrete case and our joint paper in continuous case for very special quadratic, uh, uh, for very special nonlinearity, um, right? And that's, uh, uh, I don't think I know anything else in the viscous case. So I wanted to draw your attention basically uh, at least on this slide, to two problems. First, in dimension equals one, there is not a single counter example, and the standing sort of conjecture is the proof homogenization for sufficiently general class of non-convex Hamiltonians in the viscous case. It's really hard to imagine, at least to me, that if there is homogenization for Hamiltonian in inviscid case, you go to, say, uniformly elliptic viscous case, and homogenization may fail. No, that, that, that should, not be, uh, should not be the case. But so far, uh, as far as we know, in dimension one, there is a whole bunch of examples in viscous case for dimension one when homogenization occurs, but there is still not a complete result. Even there is no result for a homogenization of level set convex Hamiltonian, Hamiltonians in the viscous case in dimension one. And of course, more generally, we would like to have, if possible, the result for level set convex Hamiltonians in the viscous case for all dimensions. Um, right. So returning, going to, to multidimensional e e examples in, in dimensions one and more, the very first example I'm aware of in inviscid case, actually, uh, I remember this example uh, very well. It came, it came a bit earlier than in 2015. Probably the paper came in 2013, and I read it the day I, I, I actually saw the paper. So the Hamiltonian is a double well, the double well Hamiltonian. Um, in this, for this, for this setting, Armstrong, Tran, and you proved that homogenization occurs. And the pictures I drew, I drew today, if you sort of rotate them uh, radially, you get, you get the idea about, uh, uh, you get uh, the effective Hamiltonian uh, looks very, uh, so the, the phenomenology for effective Hamiltonian in this case is very similar to the one uh, I described today. Right, so uh, it's just a rotation. This one is rotationally invariant, so you just have to rotate. Um, well, maybe I'm, I'm, I don't wanna say that, but uh, so this was the, the first example. And then additional examples were provided in inviscid case by Feldman and Suganidis, where, where Hamiltonian could have strictly star shade a star-shaped sublevel sets. And then um, it's almost simultaneous to me, the paper of Chien, Tran, and Yu uh, considered uh, a class of Hamiltonians, class of G, which generalizes this example. So you just take F 
the function f of p, which is even, coercive, level set convex with a negative minimum. And then you basically take such a function, then you cut the minimum, then you turn it upside down. So maybe I should draw a picture. So you take level set convex, you cut it, you cut it at a certain level, and then you turn it upside down and glue back to and get the get the function get the function get the function f and this is f of right so for this kind of uh, nonlinearities uh, there is a homogenization in in viscid case right now for the viscous case in uh, the work which I already quoted by Cardelligate and Suganidis, from which we, we got the existence of characters, there is a class of additional class of examples with radially symmetric when A and H have radially symmetric law, A is zero homogeneous in P. Here I did not put in my equation the dependence on P, but uh, they allow the dependence of P on P as long as it's zero homogeneous in P. And H in, in momentum variable satisfies, satisfies this. Essentially one homogeneous in P. So uh, I would really like, uh, if, if I forgot something, I would really like to know what I forgot. And uh, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention if you are still there. <laughs> And uh, I welcome any questions. Thank you.